Thank you. All right, so um, as we said, the first of the five E's that Tom breaks things down for uh, describing the vision statement of Hope Bible Church is it that we are to be, in his vision, an exemplary church. Um, I have to, we'll get to it in a little bit, but but for me, this is this is real personal. Um, this is the vision statement and so forth, because this is something that goes back before the founding of, uh, actual founding of Hope Bible Church and the uh, exception that conceptually and where God placed it in people's minds. Um, and there are visions that I had uh, in 1995 when first uh, telling Tom that he ought to plant a church here. Um, and uh, the vision I had of what would be Hope Bible Church or why was there a need for Hope Bible Church was far, far inferior to what Hope Bible Church has become and what this vision statement is. So it's a, it's a testimony to what God even uses those of us who are short-sighted, um, small-sighted, uh, lack of faith or vision or whatever, um, but he will march on to build his church. But Tom has done a very good job, um, probably not an exhaustive one, probably not perfect as we are, none of us perfect, but this is as best right now as he's come up with to try to explain the vision he had as he went to masters, learned from the men that he was discipled from over there and had God uh, implant in him a, a zeal for planting a church and what that church would do. He saw some things and he'll reference some of these things in this statement as well. So an exemplary church, um, Hope Bible Church from its inception was an endeavor to be a local body of believers who emulate what scripture teaches about being genuine followers of Jesus Christ, corporately call, as called, justified, born again, and baptized believers, drenched in God's grace, we strive to set true biblical example of godly church by establishing and maintaining a high view of God, a high view of scriptures, high view of our Christian calling, and a high view of God's grace shown in Christ. We purposefully rely on the New, Test New Covenant presence of the Holy Spirit to create in us a dy dynamic worshiping, serving, loving, sacrificing, giving, fellowshipping, evangelizing, and accountable community in which the presence of Christ is manifest through us and to this dark and dying world. So I want you to flip down. Let's just talk about how he expounds on the exemplary church. Yes. By exemplary, we do not mean we are perfect or even near perfect, nor do we mean that we may regard ourselves as better than other local congregations. Sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes we get a little proud, guys. We recognize that Hope Bible Church, like many other local churches, is simply one church in one location, Columbia, Maryland, standing in a long line of historic Christian churches throughout the world. We are part of one church universal, which belongs to Christ, Galatians 1, 22, Ephesians 1, 22, and 23. And by the way, he has references here. I haven't pulled them out. I don't know if, if anybody wants to look ahead and bring, uh, pop up and be able to um, just read those things. Um, I've, I've looked at those references. They all, they all are very crucial and meaningful to his statement here. But if you have a Bible in front of you and we flip to them, that's what we're talking is great. Um, in this sense, there is nothing special about HBC or our vision for the future. We are like many thousands of churches in the USA and overseas teaching the Bible, preaching the gospel, and trying to live for Christ while surrounded by unbelievers, false religions, and skeptics. We recognize that we are part of a larger community of believers who live and sometimes suffer for the sake of Christ. We also recognize that we stand on the shoulders of untold great men and women of God and who have faithfully served our Jesus in centuries past and now have been promoted to heaven. And we have Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians here. We 
are privileged to be one church allowed to serve God and bear fruit for eternity, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. We mean that we strive to set a good example for other Christian churches. Being exemplary is our goal. As a local church, HBC is one body working together to honor the head of the body, Jesus Christ, and his father who sent him to be the savior of the world, 1 John 4, 14. Just as the, <coughs> go ahead, somebody, I heard somebody. Just as the illusion of the human body conveys, we are known, we know that we are joined to one another in Christ and have a unified purpose, doctrine, and mission in this world. 1 Corinthians 12. We are not fragmented Christians, but a body ministering to one another and building one another up by loving, exhorting, serving, forgiving one another. And a little of that goes to the point you were making earlier, Jeff, serving one another as you're serving this class and, and others doing the same thing. But there's many other ways of service, as we can see. With all the hypocrisy in religion these days, we strive to be true in our profession of faith, taking our faith seriously, living genuine Christian lives before others. This involves commitment to discipleship, constant self-evaluation, and regular correction. We confess sin, learn from our mistakes, and continue to grow in humble Christ-likeness. The idea of Hope Bible Church originated in the minds and plans of God. But the Lord put the vision for the church in the heart of Tom Lee while attending Master's Seminary in Los Angeles to prepare for full-time gospel preaching ministry. Contrary to his own initial plans and surprising his initial limited vision, for passing, excuse me, God moved upon his heart to return to Maryland gather a small group of committed Christian families and plant a church, which in time and with much prayer and labor would impact the region for Christ via expository pulpit, strong doctrinal instruction, and a belief in the power and sufficiency of the Bible, a passion for Christ, a commitment to discipleship, and inter-church cooperation. This was the original design of the church and through many faces has changed this goal remains to this day so a lot in that packed in that in that uh in that paragraph folks uh about what was some of the vision and where that vision is going and we could spend a lot of time on each one of those phrases quite frankly um uh, and yes um as tom has said many times before this was the furthest thing from his mind of coming back and planning a church in fact, when I mentioned that to him the first time, he told me it was the dumbest idea he ever heard and that would never take place because he was going to be a missionary someplace and never coming back to the state of Maryland. And so God had plans and, and how he worked on Tom's heart. In accordance with his training at Masters, the Lord gave him a vision to see churches return to faith in the full authority, clarity, and sufficiency of God's written word in all areas of ministry. Other pastors, and professors had already ingrained in him a high view of God in scripture. And he had desired to make these concepts the bedrock of a new church in the mid Maryland area. In essence, HBC was an attempt to return to the original or origins of the early church and reform modern American churches to the old standard of how to do church. Part of that vision arose out of the awareness of the desperate need in Maryland mid-Atlantic region for churches that had these distinctives. Having grown up in Maryland and even attended seminary there earlier in his life, Tom was aware of the absence of consistent Bible churches in the region. The evangelical churches that existed typically displayed inconsistencies in their approach to ministry, a mixture of biblical and worldly approaches. They affirmed the authority, and in some cases, the inerrancy of scripture. And by the way, at that point in time, as I remember, in churches that I was going to and so forth, there was a, there were, there were 
traditional churches, there were conservative churches, biblical churches, but they were looking at what, how do we get church growth going on? And so the church growth movement kind of was springing to life at that point in time. So I think a lot of that's what he's referring to at that way, um, at that point. Um, they affirmed the authority, and in some cases the inerrancy of scripture, but they did not saturate their ministries with the word, nor stand solely upon the solid rock of God's truth. Sadly, to some conservative Bible churches were teaching an easy, easy believism in the gospel, hence the church growth movement, one not requiring repentance from sin. They were watering down the claims of Christ upon believers and the definition of saving faith. Few churches were known to be expositional from the pulpit or practice sufficiency of scripture to meet the counseling needs of the people in all aspects of life. And that's a very important statement too. And we're extremely privileged as a church to be having somebody like Gabe who's developing a counseling center, a biblical counseling center here at Hope today. So go ahead, Anne. Uh, since you mentioned biblical counseling, just to let you know, um, Gabe put it out on Facebook. I don't know if he put it on Hope Book, but yesterday, Jay Adams, who is the founder of New Thetic Biblical Counseling, passed into God's presence. And he is a giant in that in that that realm. And and if you can get anything your hands on anything by Jay Adams, uh, you will be blessed and and uh, edified in reading it and learning from a fantastic scriptural uh, guy. So and counseling. Okay, um, where are we here? Um, New churches were known as expositional from the pulpit practicing specialists to meet the counseling needs of their people in all aspects of life. Still, other conservative churches tended towards the legalistic side of Christian application, narrowing Christian living in ways of scripture that did not, majoring in the minors and distorting the vibrant uh, um, life Christ invited his followers to enter and discover. And it just a, a, a side note to mention in that regard, as we have developed it, at Hope, there have been people who have come to Hope who are steeped in a much more uh, legalistic or narrow um, concept of how to do church. Um, and, you know, you, you don't wear dresses that are two inches below the knee or above the knee or whatever. You don't play cards. You don't go to movies. You don't dance. You don't um, you don't have uh, wine with a meal or whatever. Um, and, and making these um, uh, absolute commands um, to up to the same level of commands of scripture. These are things that have, um, that were prevalent um, before uh, 50s, 60s, 70s in some churches, people trying to err on the side of conservatism. Um, in a world that was, uh, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and, and sometimes, um, and we've had people at Hope to do that. We still have people sometimes that do that. Even, um, even some of the leaders sometimes have to catch themselves and think, okay, is this something? Am I putting too heavy a restriction that the Bible doesn't make on, on what we're doing? So we always have to keep that in mind. It's this, it is a scripture that is our guide, not our customs and, uh, you know, our feelings. Um, these churches through gospel preaching and Bible believing were not representing well the historic uh, biblical conservative Christian faith. Another model was needed for believers in our age and in our age and region. One could be could argue for Christ to display his power, one that could uh, be uh, exported to other churches. Okay, so there you have kind of in a nutshell, one little thing to think about of uh, what Hope Bible Church is. It's one that's going to be able to, to uh, preach and teach and display his power. Um, and one also that can equip and um, support that what we are doing to other churches have an effect larger and greater than our own congregation. Tom was privileged to see that model in Los Angeles, a Grace Community Church under the leadership of John MacArthur. That was uh, needed on the East Coast too, was a strong uh, 
uh, uh, ex, um, ex, <laughs> exactly, ex yeah, I got it, based theological foundation, exegetically found, with sound hermeneutics, interpretive principles, expressing itself in thoroughly biblically philosophical, philosophical philosophy of local church ministry and the love of the people expressed to each other. Okay. So that was kind of in the mind of what an exemplary church is, uh, is, is to him. With the encouragement of me, um, a close friend, um, uh, family members, men at uh, seminary, and um, then he, he like-minded men in Maryland, including Alan Plumley and then Ross Levin, who followed him from California. The Leaks came back to Maryland to launch HPC and its vision. By the way, I want to mention something kind of interesting how God um, in this entire world of seven or more billion, seven more billion people is intricately involved in the connection between individuals uh, all over the globe. Um, that time when I mentioned, you know, putting this idea in Tom's head, thinking about it, my wife and I talking about it, a, a dumb idea that we had. Um, we met, we went to visit Tom. This is six weeks after he uh, left Maryland, never to come back and to go and um, uh, learn from the masters and to use, uh, be, be appointed by God to go and be a missionary wherever around the world he would do, not knowing, but not coming back to Maryland. Um, we were in his two bedroom apartment there in California. Um, six weeks later, we had a trip planned by the family, went out there and motor home and did a nice 11,000 trip around the country. And one of the week we stopped, we spent there in, in Los Angeles. And Tom already had a small group of people doing a Bible study set up already and uh, in his community. And he met some neighbors and the one neighbor he met um, that we met brought over the house we had an evening with was Ross and Becky Levin. Um, so we met them two years even before we began Hope Bible Church. And Interesting enough, Becky, Ross and Becky were familiar with me, my last name, because of my older brother. They were both in the Amway business, and, and they knew my brother's big reputation in the Amway business or whatever. Um, and so it was kind of an interesting connection, and I had no idea that it would have the, the, the way it would turn out that Ross would become uh, so important to the Hope Bible Church here on the East Coast, or he would even move to the East Coast. Um, so it's just an interesting thing how God... He knows where everybody is. He knows where every atom in the universe is. It's placed exactly where he wants it. It's doing what he wants it to do. He has a plan. Um, so from a core group of committed families and singles, uh, his mom being a single, to, to its present large size, uh, God has birth, sustained, and provided for hope Bible Church despite our weaknesses in their men. Hesitancies sometimes short-sighted decisions and lack of experiences. Many other key men and women filled the needs of the church through the years and helped her fulfill her calling. Their contribution and love left an indelible mark on HBC. HBC is a product of God's work in grace. And I would say here too, just as God used Pharaoh and hardened his heart to demonstrate his glory and fulfill his plan, so too, there were people that came to Hope Bible Church that God used in that manner as well. Some causing um, a, a bit of frustrations on us, but also always pointing to the fact of God's faithfulness and, and showing his power. So to be a model church, we know that we must first be Christians worthy of being emulated, <laughs> a daunting and fearful prospect when you think about our own inconsistencies. Therefore, we dare rely on our own uh, dare, dare rely on our own strength, nor do we um, define what it means to be a Christian from popular evangelical culture. We glean our understanding of what is true Christian uh, is from the pages of scripture, not from historical formulations, social trends, or popular opinions. We recognize that only scripture can reveal and define what Christian is and what a church of Jesus should look like. Our confidence that we uh, are walking like Jesus comes from our stubborn adherence to the teachings of scripture. We recognize that we are not just 
some body thrown together to serve ourselves or some cause. And, 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 and by that is meant that a lot of times churches get together because we're like-minded, we, we look alike, we dress alike, we think alike, we uh, have the same uh, customs and culture and so forth. And we want to just feel good about having be together with people we like and so forth. That's not what we are. We're not thrown together just because we are, we want to, uh, you know, do it for ourselves, but, and for some cause like, oh, we're all against abortion and we want to do this or we, we're going to, you know, whatever we might do, but a body of followers of Jesus Christ here to do his will, his will. Each of us in the body enters the body and works inside the body with understanding that we follow our teacher, the Lord, individually and corporately. We are earnestly striving to be more like Christ as we follow in his footsteps and learn to obey his commands. First Peter 2.21 says, for you have been called for this purpose because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you would follow in his steps. We are not a body of politic or a body of citizens working for the benefit of mankind generally. So those things don't, it's not that bad to do good works. But that's not what we're here for. We, we are not in, in, um, to enact or pursue some lesser social goal, however noble some may be that the goal be, okay? We, our calling is to be followers of Jesus Christ, the infinite son of God, to accomplish his mission for his church. Luke 24, 46, 49, and, and he said to them, so it is written that the, that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And their repentance, that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you. You are to stay in the city until you are clothed from the power on high. And we know Pentecost came and we're clothed with the power on high. We trust the wisdom of God, of the son of God over any um, expedient goal or cause touted by our nation or religious leaders. All churches of course speak God, of God, and the scriptures. They teach some of the Bible, worship, and witness their faith. They also speak of living as Christians and relying on grace of God. HBC strives to promote a high, serious, and reverent view of these key Christian teachings. We desire to promote and base our lives upon the highest expression of each of these biblical doctrines. A high view of God means that we emphasize the sovereignty of God over all affairs of men and teach the full array of God's matchless attributes. We hold forth the truth that man is not in control, but God who is high above humanity reigns sovereign. God is not a God of love, uh, not, not just a God of love, but of holiness, justice, and wrath. He is the sole creator of all things and holds all things in his hands. A high view of scripture promotes the fact that every syllable of scripture comes from the breath of God and is therefore infallible, inerrant, powerful, authoritative, necessary, and sufficient for life and godliness. We focus on the words of scripture, studying them and believing them, that they are the words of life. We live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. A high view of our Christian calling promotes the Bible's teaching that those who name the name of Christ should abstain from wickedness and compromise. We should strive to walk like Christ walked, 1 John 2 and 6. They should be willing to be held accountable in a congregation of believers for what they do at home and at work. Thessalonians, a high view of the grace of God promotes the Bible's teaching that the grace of God is all from God. Man does not add his to his salvation. In Ephesians, God and his grace gets all the credit 
for your faith, our salvation and our fruit. And that's Romans. The fruit we bear is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not our own. That's Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. We rely on the Holy Spirit under the stipulations and provisions of the new covenant. The new covenant promises an abiding presence of the Holy Spirit with believers. It promises he will live inside each believer's body. Indeed, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who in us, who's in us. Um, one thing I just regarded that, and it's just something recent as I was reading, um, I can't remember exactly who, but it was talking about the fact that we are in fact um, uh, embodied, embodied spirits. We, Jesus talks about God knowing us before the creation of the world. Um, and uh, we were chosen in him before the creation of the world. Uh, that was before I had a body, um, but my spirit was known to him. My spirit lives on when this body will go in the grave and, and corrupt and decay. Um, I get a new body, a glorified body, um, but clearly this body is uh, carrying around and is being used uh, and it's been indwelt by a spirit, my spirit. But I also have him dwelt by the Holy Spirit as Christians, that's, that's what we are. So it's kind of an interesting comment to think of ourselves as in embodied spirit. So I might look at, and I look at you as one way because I see you on the outside, you look at me one way and so forth, but there is a spirit. And it, it also kind of brings some kind of clarity a little bit in my mind to think about when Jesus was being challenged by the Pharisees about whose wife um, is she anyway, after marrying the seven brothers, um, he says, that's not the way it is in heaven. And that kind of makes it a little more clear to me or makes it more understandable that if we're embodied spirits, it's not our bodies that Paul talks about carrying around this body of death, um, sinful flesh. It is our spirit that is the one that is eternal and something we do it. So it's, it's just in interesting about it that our bodies here on earth are temples of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses um, the, the, the preached and taught word to drive forward all we do in the church. The Spirit creates the community of believers in all its dynamic and moving parts. The church is uh, not simply a series of formal programs and events. The Spirit is constantly at work in the relationship and varied interactions going on in the church at all levels. The church is a living organism, a moving and changing dynamic as the spirit promotes and teaches us through God's word. The Holy Spirit creates a dynamic that involves a worshiping community focused on the glory and majesty of God. Our community of believers share life in Christ with one another. The sharing of life and service, evangelism and worship is called fellowship. Relationship develop naturally with those who have this common outlook on life. Those relationships become dear to us and a source of our strength. That is one reason we recite a pledge to keep our membership covenant with one another. Using New Testament teacher, teaching, it expresses our commitment to one another as a body of Christ. And again, you can read that covenant uh, in our um, on, online there. Um, and it's, it's, it's important to keep rem reminding ourselves that covenant we took, even when it was a long time ago and so forth. And many of the, uh, of the, uh, the lines of it, the covenants that we make in it are so very crucial um, that we should do. It bears looking at um, frequently. Another aspect about um, a tight and caring community is the built-in accountability. Everyone is urged to be accepting and forgiving of one another, yet we try never to excuse our wrong behavior. Sin and offenses must be convinced, confessed and abandoned because unlike society, we are a community based on truth, not falsehood in Matthew 18. When sins, and we looked at that extensively, with sins, uh, when sins are stubbornly clung to and damage 
is being done to the body, the body must cleanse itself and enact, appro enact appropriate measures, responses to protect the vitality of the body and help the wayward soul. This is loving Christian accountability and needed biblical discipline. Unlike explo explosive and, uh, or damaging power, the power of God is enacted in the lives of spirit-filled community in a quiet and constructive manner. Lives are transformed. Love permeates the atmosphere of the church community. As this power is experienced, the very character of Jesus is revealed in his body. Christ, through hidden from the sight in the heavens, is seen in the lives of believers, especially as they interact with one another in godliness. One way that power of God has been seen to work by, by God bringing together a diverse community of worshipers as one congregation at HBC. And I've often, some of you have often heard it said so again, again in, the, in the initial concept, in my mind, in my wife's mind, we were small in minds thinking, we were homeschool family, we knew a few other homeschool families, we had certain of the same kind of desires and, and uh, wanted to see a church that would preach. We knew Tom, we knew some of the, uh, theology and philosophies that he had and thought he'd make a great preacher uh, and, a, and, a, and someone to gather around a community to espouse those beliefs and feelings and culture and whatever. We were all at that time that I know of, uh, every one of the people we thought uh, white families, we all were homeschool families, um, very, very limited, um, uh, very subset of a subset of a subset, if you would. And didn't think too much about a problem with that. <laughs> um, as God developed Hope Bible Church, it was never um, a matter of saying, okay, we, we've, we put some goals on the board and say, what we need to do is become more diverse, we need to do this, uh, and here's how we do it. We're going to have a, a diversity uh, campaign to try to get more people of different um, backgrounds and cultures and countries and languages or whatever else together. Um, so that we can represent uh, God's people more. Never, never really thought by me, at least, as a purpose. I believe uh, Tom had seen that since he was um, in California, um, a, a pastoring a Filipino church um, in California while he was going to school. And um, I think that kind of drove him a little bit, but he has a little more thoughts on that even earlier than I. Um, but what, what developed in hope is just God's work. It was just fantastic to see it happen. Um, so the Lord has mixed various ethnic groups into one body of Christ here with different ages, educational backgrounds, denominational backgrounds, and family arrangement. HBC is a diverse church serving with one voice to glorify God. Galatians there. The church community is light to the world because the church itself manifests Christ to the unbelieving world, First Peter. Because we are a diverse church, the leaders should strive to persevere, preserve unity through the knowledge and interaction with these varying cultures. And this is a, I guess, a very timely topic because our country um, politics seeks to divide based on differences uh, and so forth. Um, and so for our church, we need to um, avoid those divisional kind of things and be unified and such. So uh, I would want to, a question I want to have at this top at this point, just ask in what ways are we not a diverse church at this point? Anybody want to think about that diversity? Can you think of ways we're not a diverse church? Well, it, um, thinking back to the the you know the the beliefs or the vision of the church, you know, we're we're all uh, unified in what we think our church should be, which is why we're attending here at HBC, uh, as well as the Triune God and basic uh, uh, primary principles of the Bible. So we're all. Uh, in agreement on those primary principles, so we're unified in that state. That's yeah, 
right? With that, and you hit it right the nail on the head. Thank you, Ron. Um, that was, I was thinking this thing. It says, in a lot of things, we want to be diverse. And one thing, we don't want to be diverse. We are unified in Christ. So, and one of the things that um, a lot of churches before hope, um, before we have found hope, uh, and even now still, um, avoid teaching difficult doctrine because they say that's divisional, that divides. Um, but on the contrary, it actually unifies. Um, teaching good doctrine is understanding the scripture, understanding God's speaking to us is unity. We are unified in our um, being saved by the grace of Lord Jesus Christ. We are unified in our belief as, for him as Lord. Um, and we want to be in be as one with regard to that. But we have many different other kinds of, of things that we do and, and from our particular experiences and so forth, and we should appreciate them. That diversity is something that, as you look out in creation, there's such a diversity in creation. Um, you don't have to even leave this planet to see it. Uh, you don't have to leave your backyard to see it. Um, there's such diversity. God is a God that loves diversity and creativity. And so we should celebrate that and uh, praise God for it. But one thing we are unified on is Christ. And uh, that makes us all one. Okay, Christ told his fathers in Matthew that they were to the light of the world and to be shine their light before men, not to draw attention to themselves, but to reflect all the praise and the glory back to heaven, the Father. HBC has been set by God in a broader community to be seen by them to shine biblical hope into the lives of those searching for it. Learning Christ in the scripture brings the very light of eternal life into the human soul. First John, we recognize the immense privilege of being a church which shines the light of hope, as our name indicates, for Jesus and our greater community. People need that light because God's view his entire world of humanity as lost off the kilter of their understanding, beliefs, morals, and practices, uh, Romans and Ephesians. Their educational establishments, arts, sports, leisure, humanities, and at times even their science misunderstands truth in 1 Corinthians. A dark world stubbornly bent on going the wrong direction desperately needs the light of Christ, Romans. Churches like HPC are set on a hill to shine the truth upon all who will listen and internalize God's wisdom for their life. Being that light is who we are. It is in our DNA. It is what we are called to be, Philippians. So that's God, uh, Tom's um, fleshing out more fully the concept of what he envisions, what he's thought through of what an exemplary church would be. Are there any thoughts before we move on to the next E? Let's think about anything of what's exemplary, what's not, what, what also must we be doing to maintain that exemplary church and so forth, anybody? Do we ever, do we ever reach that uh, vision of being the exemplary church? Have we? Uh, Going to be a constant striving as people come and go, and people are are sanctified as they as their uh, uh, life in Christ grows. Yeah, and it can be lost in, in a generation or less, as we say too. So it's important for us to pass it down and continually talk about it and can teach it, this vision statement. One of the reasons why, again, I'm glad that Tom put it together so it can be referred to in you know, ages forward so people can look at it. Not that, one, one of the things that um, has, and Alan has mentioned lots of times, talk the evolution of, of churches um, culturally and so forth. You have many of the, the mainline denomination churches coming out of a 
very fervent zeal to recover the truth and, and teach the truth. And then over the course of time, generation after generation, it passes down, becomes watered down, becomes apostate. Um, and and the, the, the reason is you get a good church starting out, it has a, uh, it's, it has a great principle behind it. Yes, it's recovering the scripture, going back to scripture. That's the first generation. They have a great zeal for it. They had to fight for it, maybe even um, had to put their lives on the line for it uh, to do it. So they're, they're, they're intent upon these, these uh, principles and these, these beliefs. Then you have a second generation who grow up in that environment very happily, and, and they're blessed by it because they, they have the truth being bathed and so forth, but they've never had to fight for it the way that their predecessors did. And it's not, it's not as valued to them. It's not as treasured maybe to them. Um, and then their next generation uh, are taught these things, but it's kind of like too far and so forth. Never, it was not a struggle. Um, and ultimately compromise seeps into the church. And that compromise ultimately destroys the church when it compromises on, on you know, a theological doctrine that's crucial, crucial doctrines. So we don't want to fight over those things. Oh, no, I, you know, we, we, you know, sure, you know, Joe can marry Bill and and so forth. That uh, they love each other and it's committed relationship. This was, you know, something like, well, you know, we we don't believe in in you know the roles that. Uh, uh, of headship and so forth. Teaching these things become some, sometimes um, controversial. And some churches are in positions to say, we can't avoid that controversy. And so they'll compromise and say, but it's important that you believe in Jesus, that he's the son of God and he, he rose from the dead and he saved you. So you don't have to believe in a six day creation and the literacy of the word of God but you could believe in theistic evolution, that there were billions of years, even death before uh, Adam and Eve and, and death before sin. So somehow it gets confusing. You see, you see what I'm talking about, the churches can get that way. And so can Hope Bible Church. So this vision statement is one, it's sort of like uh, a, a foundation that, that hopefully generations in the future will look back to improve upon perhaps, uh, but also, be brought back to looking at scripture and holding to the truths that that uh, that are there. Rose, I would say, uh, I think two words that go together and have to be together um, is truth and love, right? And not to um, to focus on one at the detriment of the other. I think uh, a lot of churches, and you talked about earlier about some churches that have been a little bit more on a legalistic side, where we've focused a lot on the truth of scripture, you know, the, the very the, the very black and white of scripture, the, the letter of the law, and not necessarily um, understanding the, the, the spirit of the law. Um, some churches will focus um, primarily on the very, like I said, very black and white things and not deal with the, um, the relational aspects. And then other churches go the opposite way and focus on overemphasize love without truth or compromising truth. So I think that's an important balance to make sure that we are um, seeking the truth of scripture and preaching that and teaching that and embracing that, but also um, not at the expense of um, how we deal with others in the church too. Yeah, that's a very good point to remember um, that uh, uh, faith, hope, and love, but the one that's the primary one that remains is love. Um, so we we need to, that's where Tom was talking about in earlier, that uh, you can err on that side of legalism too much. Um, yet there are things, there's there are two, two things to think about. There is the theology of the church, there are the distinctives and so forth that, that theology is that we as Christians hold dear. Um, those things don't change. Scripture doesn't change. Uh, what does change is the mode of doing church. So how you do church, whether you sing hymns in the beginning, whether you, um, whatever it might be, whether you wear um, uh, vestments or, or not, or um, you have a liturgy, you don't have a liturgy. Um, 
there's just different things you can do in a church, whether you have a rock band, whether you allow drums, whether you have bass guitars, whether you don't have um, uh, instruments at all. Um, those things are, you know, methods of doing church, not necessarily a theological uh, thing. You can be unified with somebody in theology and they can do it totally different. Different cultures around the world do uh, church in a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, it wouldn't be the American way but that doesn't make it the American way the right way. Um, yeah, and there is a lot of legalism that has been done in the past because it was trying to kind of put a buffer or a hedge, I guess, on some of the encroachment of compromise. And it's always gotta be fought against. Okay, everybody else? Thoughts on being exemplary? You all are exemplary, right? Every one of you, you carry yourself as exemplary. Got a sign on your back, say, I am exemplary. It's a very, very tough thing to carry. So as a church, we have to do that. And, and also the world is always looking at shooting darts at the church, is it not? Looking for any, any uh, speck of, of uh, you know, dirt that they can pull up um, and say, oh, yeah, you're being inconsistent. You're being uh, you know, not, not uh, fair-minded or whatever. So it's a, it's, a, it's a heavy burden to bear, but how, how do we bear it? How is that born? How do we have the power to bear that? It's through God's Holy Spirit. We can't do it in our own. The church has the Holy Spirit to help us. So we have to constantly do it. And it's in prayer. It's in attention to the word, teaching, preaching, the, you know, the, the uh, accountability those things that we've talked about before. Okay, so at the heart of um, the vision statement, if you will, and design for Hope Bible Church uh, distinctive is that it is an expositional church. Hope Bible Church cannot be an exemplary church without, and this is going back up the, the, the top, excuse me, Wait, I'm going to go back to the top of the uh, definition. He, he kind of summarizes in the thing in the top there and then all the things. So let, I'll read that for you. We endeavor to be a congregation committing to listening to God speaking through the passionate weekly exposition of God's unfailing word. Expositional preaching from a called and qualified expositor is the finest way to explain and discern the wondrous truths of the word of God. This Verb, vital uh, biblical unfolding of the full counsel of God's word is the engine the Holy Spirit uses to transform our hearts, renew our minds, and direct and motivate all we do for the kingdom of Christ. Corporately receiving the exposition of God's word and responding to it by faith fosters a unified and maturing community tuned to God's will in the pages of scripture underline that unified and maturing community. So Hope Bible Church cannot be an exemplary church without the word of God being central to all we teach and do. That is why Hope Bible Church endeavors to be a word-driven church. That means that like the early church, we are not driven forward by other forces or factors than preaching and teaching of God's word. Acts 2.42, Ephesians 4, and so on. We believe that the remaining center, remaining centered on the constant exposition of God's Bible will yield a well-balanced congregation committed to everything scripture exhorts believers to be engaged in. That is why the ex exposition of scripture is the center and the heartbeat, yes, the engine, of HBC. The most important indication of any local church's health, that's why I wanna do that 21 later, we'll talk about health church later, is how they open up and explain the word of God regularly to their people from the pulpit and how well the people receive and practice it. Where the Bible is faithfully expo ex uh, exposited and received in faith by the people, the Spirit of God works to mold them into the kind of Christ-honoring people useful to the Master. 
2 Timothy. Another way of putting this is, as the pulpit goes, so goes the rest of the church in 2 Timothy. This is why we are committed to 50 minutes each Sunday to listen to God as we had, are gathered in his presence for corporate worship. We consider hearing the voice of God in scriptures the highlight of worshiping community. So a, a lot of people, just a couple of things, um, there are people who will complain that, gee, the sermons are too long. And maybe some of you have been in churches where, Pastor, can't you shorten your sermon? And the guy's doing a 20 minute sermon, right? Um, and they're thinking, it's just, it's just too much time, so forth. Um, we have gone the other direction, not, not three hour sermons, but I'm sure we could enjoy that if we if time would do that. Um, but we, we do a full, generally a full hour sermon and an explanation, and he's got a lot more he can present each Sunday. And as you see, sometimes he'll go and he'll, he'll have a, a continuation of a message because he really didn't get everything he wanted to get out that time frame. And did you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say those short 20 minute sermons, we used to call them sermonettes for Christianettes. <laughs> Christianettes, yeah. Yeah, and um, so that's that's one thing that, that people will complain at, with the sermons. Um, one other thing that I, I remember that people will do, I'll probably just remember it in a second. Um, but in any 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 event, um, like I said, the, the hallmark and the centerpiece of uh, what we do in our vision for Hope Bible Church is expositional preaching, uh, because that's where it all begins, as he says the engine. Unfortunately, much preaching in the conservative church today, though from the Bible, has little life, energy, or passion to it. It proclaims truth but it does not always convey the spirit of that truth. Rather, it communicates what can descend into cold, stale, and lifeless messages from that informed mind, but fail to transform with lives. However, God's word is meant to change lives from the inside out and result in heartfelt worship and obedience. James 1. True Preaching is passionate about the truth and communicates it uh, communicates uh, because it communicates the importance and urgency uh, of the message. Expository preaching is, as D. Martin Doyle Jones describes, logic on fire. The Bible is the very word of God and as such must be heard with its full reasonableness and great urgency. To convey his message to his people, God calls some men to the pulpit ministry, whom he has also gifted. And by the way, um, just a, a word, we, we had some time spent, thank you, Michael, on gifts and so forth. And indeed, we are privileged to have somebody who is truly gifted um, every Sunday and so forth, presenting God's word. But a lot of churches have people up there that are pastors that Preaching the word isn't really their gift. And we've probably been part of that. And we kind of go along and try to help and support them in that situation. But uh, it is best if we have in the pulpit a man who is truly, really gifted at expositing on God's word. Comments? This giftedness is an important part of God's design to ready a man to bring his word to his people weekly. Since God chooses to speak to his congregation weekly through the preaching of the word, only men called, trained, and qualified, and ordained should be entrusted with his sober responsibility. First Timothy and Second Timothy. Some pastors are called to different ministries, but a pulpit pastor knows he is called to that ministry. A wrong preacher in the pulpit or a poorly prepared preacher will not result in the proper hearing uh, uh, of God speak. God speaks through his servants, the congregation, as he handles properly God's word. One thing to say about that too, that God's word does not return void, however. Even a poorly preached sermon, if it's God's word, can have great effect um, and, and such. And there are 
in areas of the country, men that have to do many, wear many hats in small congregations and maybe preaching is not their strength, but the strength of God's word and the spirit of God works through it. One of the main purposes of the pulpit ministry, um, and, and by the way, for Hope Bible Church, this is again, thinking vision wise, going forward, we should always be looking for somebody who is strongly gifted uh, preaching uh, as, as a gift in the, in the pulpit, not just saying, well, he's really good at that. He's a great, got a great uh, personality. He leads this ministry very, very well and so forth. And, and everybody loves him. It's, it's gotta be somebody who also can, you know, expound God's word. One of the main purposes of the pulpit ministry from the lead or senior pastor, and that's an important concept to remember, uh, is to set a standard that um, other elders and teachers of the church follow. And I want to say a word. We talked about elder rule earlier in the lessons here and so forth, but just to bring out and high, highlight again, uh, having a senior pastor doesn't mean that one, uh, one pastor is greater than another. Uh, one elder is greater. We have a plurality of elders. They are all elders. Elders are elders. The concept of senior pastor, though, is a leading pastor, a pastor who, who sets sort of the, the pace and the guide and the direction of the vision. So it's very important to have that man be chosen carefully and be part, uh, you know, uh, of, of that uh, organization uh, that we have. Careful contextual preaching models for the rest of the teachers um the correct way to handle the holy text and apply it to their lives the people so setting a standard the, the senior pastor will set that standard for all those that standard is an exempt example trickles down to all the ministry and teachers of the church and fosters an atmosphere of reverence and dedication and handling accurately the word of truth believers who attend a church like this have confident insurance they will hear God's word taught well throughout the church. So not just the pulpit ministry, but it has a uh, effect on all ministries as well. Okay, I think we've come to the end of our time. I do want to leave a, another moment. Any other comments that we have? We can pick this up next week as well uh, going forward um, with the rest of the ease that we have. Any other comments with what we've gone through? Think about it this week, and if you do, we can go back and, and expound on some of those things a little bit more and exemplify more of what we're talking about. All right. Okay, um, Ron, do you mind closing us in a prayer today? Sure, I can uh, give it a go. Okay, let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Lord, <clears throat> thank you for uh, bringing us together so we could uh, uh, learn uh, about your word and and what you have for us set out in our lives and uh, thank you for providing uh, uh, teachers and pastors that are committed to your word and uh, uh, teaching uh, the the truth that you've uh, established uh, for us in the word and uh, uh, thank you for also uh, providing a diversity of uh, gifts in our church so that uh, uh, our church as a whole can grow uh, in, in the way that you have designed it and um, uh, please uh, remember to uh, work on our hearts and um, uh, uh, so that we can all uh, uh, be uh, sanctified and, and, and uh, walk in the, the, the likeness of Christ that you have uh, uh, desired for us. In uh, these things we pray uh, in your son, uh, son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Dr. Adi and uh, Michael. It was great to have you here on well too okay um we'll god willing be back again next week we'll see some of you at church god bless